Hello everybody. Now I've noticed that I've seen a lot of people who don't even know what's going on with uh, Zero. You know, the, the best Smash 4 player and someone who played Ultimate for a little bit. You know, he has a very popular YouTube channel. He has a million subscribers. A lot of people, I mean, they know that he's been involved in some controversy, you know, some, dra some drama, that he's guilty of some things, but they don't know what. So I haven't seen anybody else make this video, so I'm going to go ahead and do it. I'm going to read out, you know, all, all the allegations, uh, what his accusers wrote, what Zero wrote, his confessions, uh, because Zero is guilty as, of some uh, very, very shameful and frankly wrong things. So we're going to go over that. I'm going to read it all word for word. Now, we're going to start with uh, Jesus' accusation on July 2nd. At 8.10 p.m., I'm going to uh, put a picture up, but at that time, Jizu tweeted out, This has taken me tremendous deliberation, but I'm sorrow, at, at Zero Wondering, Zero's Twitter account. You were showing me explicit Craigslist ads of sex workers and hentai on the big screen and constantly harassing me at the Sky House when I was 15. Now, that is the accusation that she brought forth. Now I'm going to read Zero's first response, because he actually had three different responses to these allegations that released in uh, at different times. So now I'm going to be reading out Zero's response to this initial accusation. Hey, I was accused by Jizu on this tweet. I'll be addressing what she said in this document. I also want to mention one more thing. I'm going to try to link all of these in the uh, description box so you can read these for yourself, make an informed decision on how you feel about it. Anyway, continuing on. I'm going to ask you to hear me out and read it fully before making your judgment. I'll address everything. I'll be direct and say that I'm shocked at her comments because I've always been under the impression that we've been on good terms years after we stopped being roommates I've never been a very interactive person and I am pretty socially awkward my main focus then was to be the best player in the world in Smash and so I did that for about 90% of my day on a daily basis apologies for that um, so most of the interactions I had with Jackie other than normal roommate things, we're exchanging random jokes with her. Please understand, I don't want to attack her in any capacity, and I do not want you guys to harass her or invalidate her feelings. I simply want to directly address what she said about me. I think it is very important to listen to victims, and I'm open to admitting anything I could have done to make her uncomfortable. Let's start off with the setting and timeline. I moved out to South Carolina to Sky's house towards the tail end of 2014. Here's the precise date and plane ticket I used to get there. Mind you, Dallas is a connection from Chile, which proves the time I moved into the house officially as my arrival date of November 20th, 2014. Now, I am also going to uh, link, or not link, I'm going to put up the pictures in this video so you can see the, the picture proof that Zero provided in his twit longer. All right, anyway, continuing. Subsequently, they also mentioned why I left the country, which is roughly February 2015. Here's a video of me doing a room tour in Chile. The video is private because I accidentally show my Chile address but the video is still ava available if I need to prove myself through a private method with a link to it. This house, Armaco Sky House, featured a multitude of Smash Bros. players. D1, Mewtwo King, Sky Williams, Zex, Tyrant, Xax are the most notable names for the Smash scene. Also, if I mispronounce any of those gamer tags, I apologize to them, especially Mewtwo King. Continuing, since there were other people not as involved in it that lived there. This video shows how small the house was for like 10 plus people living in it. I was assigned to live in the room on the side on a bunk bed under Mewtwo King. 
and in front of it, there was another bunk bed where Jackie and Vidjo were at. For reference, the room can be seen here. To be noted is the desk with the big TV and monitors on the side. I didn't have an actual computer at the time, and I just used a little laptop on the sides of these desks. You can see me recording a video with it here, which also gives you a good perspective of the room. After I left the house in February 2015, I returned to Chile as I mentioned before, then went to live in Arizona with Mewtwo King and MVG in March. Here's a video that shows the house and setting and proves the date. Roughly around May of 2015, I went back to the Armaco Sky House and remained there for roughly 2-3 months before we moved to the new location of the house, where Jackie did not follow and moved elsewhere before we moved into the new house. After this, my interactions with Jackie were strictly online and at tournaments where she always had an art booth. This is all to give you a perspective on the place and timeline of events. My experience with Jackie. My main relation with Jackie was a friend level, and here are many screenshots of our entire conversation log. I looked through our entire log, which isn't long. The date of the messages will help with reflecting the timeline of events. Now, I actually am going to even read these. All right, the date for the first one is uh, March 5th, 2015 at uh, 343 in the morning. Uh, Zero says, Jackie, your chibis are sick, lol. She responds, thanks, man. I try. A heart emoji. Hook me up with one. It's so sick, lol. Please. And he, another heart emoji. Oh, anything for you. Just need the cash. Lol. Another heart emoji. Uh, LMFAO. And a lot of, a lot of O's. Sure. I need some graphic stuff. What you need, honey buns? Four Z's. The date here is important because it shows even after the first time I left Armacost, Jackie was still very friendly towards me. And continuing on, he has another screenshot. It's the same conversation I just read continued on. Um, she says, I'm sorry if I'm being weird. Everyone in the room is having too much fun, lol. It's cool. Haha. -ha. I'm thinking a chibi version of me with a scarf and glasses. And my haircut on my profile pic. Would be sick, lol. And a red background. She responds, that sounds good. More than good. It's a uh, gato. He responds, sweet. How much you need from me? I'll pay pals. She responds, normally I charge 50, but since you the honey buns. Now that's it of the screenshots for now, so we're going to continue with what Zero was writing. Jackie often called me nicknames. In this particular screenshot, she randomly called me honey buns, which I wasn't particularly fond of. And as you can see, she apologized because it wasn't in character, and I just brushed it off awkwardly and went back to talking about the commission and business in general. I didn't want to tell her. I felt a bit weird about it and just moved on from it. The next two screenshots will prove this was a consistent behavior with her being comfortable around me. Um, another snapshot here, Zero seems to use the search function for Facebook Messenger to look up the word uh, burrito. <laughs> And there are a lot of them, though they don't have the dates. Then he provides another screenshot. This one's from March 20th, 2015. The dates kind of vary, but it starts at 11.59 p.m. Um, she says, yeah, no prob, bruh. Anything for the burrito? He responds, okay, Jackie, you there? She responds, yo, here now. And then again, okay, burrito, are you there? He's not responding. Um... She responds, uh, Gonzalo, burritos. He's like, hey. Continuing on, Jackie also on many occasions felt comfortable enough to ask me for help to promote her work and art, which I was supportive generally as well. Here are a couple of screenshots of that. All right, this is from uh, March 10th, 2015, around uh, 7 o'clock p.m. Zero says, I love it. Yep. 
I'll throw you in my updates. She responds, thank you, with an emoji that looks like it's crying. I'm really glad you like it. Melissa, let me, let me know that I should have more exposure with my skills. So I'm trying to actually market myself now, lol. We'll see how this goes. Zero responds, absolutely, you have some super good stuff. She responds, thanks. I will bury your kind words forever in my Kokoro. So glad Senpai noticed me. Now this next snapshot is from uh, July 8th, 2015, uh, at 1.18 in the morning. Uh, she says, Sup dude, so I made the official announcement for my site. Do you mind sharing slash spreading the word so it can reach more smashers? I already made posts about it. She leaks the post. I'm really trying to push the standards of the creative content within this community. So your help is really appreciated. Zero responds, sorry I was late. And she responds, it's okay lol. I appreciate all your support anyways. This other snapshot is from April 17th of 2016 at 10.13 in the morning. Uh, she messages Zero, Jackie, and says, Yo, happy birthday, my dude, 21. Zero responds, or sorry, my apologies. Uh, the next response is also from uh, Jizu, uh, Jackie, and she says, Hey, Zero. So TwitchCon has given me five tickets to give away, and I want to do five different ways to win each one. One category being best combo vid slash GIF. I'm only familiar with Melee, so I want to know if you want to judge Smash 4, because I don't want to eliminate a whole demographic just because I'm not familiar with the game. Alright, continuing on. This last message is my last interaction with her, since I did not respond to this image. Note the date, because up to this date in 2016, she still wasn't uncomfortable with me and felt familiar enough to ask for favors. He provides another screenshot. It's from February 10th, 2015 at 2.31 in the morning. Zero says, good idea. I'm leaving this Wednesday. I'll try my best to leave the place clean. Well, he, he means clean, but he says Kilwan. Unless that's a secret code for something, I'll assume it's clean. Anyway, but it doesn't mean it'll be clean when you guys get here. Haha. -ha. Then she uh, responds, Oh no, I wish you could stay and guard the place. Has anyone attempted to steal slash trash our things yet? And he responds, Just Jesse's chair, LeMayo, and me and D1 are just using the TV in the room for games. But that's it really. Continue on. She generally trusted my character. And here's an example of where she would want me to protect her belongings because sometimes at the Sky House, people would steal things if you weren't careful about them. And Jackie had a lot of expensive art electronics, which I often did keep a look for when she wasn't around. That's pretty much the gist of our online interactions. For in-person interactions, the only proof I can provide is video evidence of us interacting in general which you can find on my channel, and they've always been available. You can see Jackie laughing in the background overall having a good time in this video, where I pranked Mewtwo King at uh, 1.45 of this video. Jackie is also the main person laughing in this video, and was helping me keep track of chat here. Past the Armacost Sky House, and when we moved into the second house, my interactions with Jackie moved entirely to when I saw her at Smash Bros. events, where she often had an art booth. I would sometimes stop by, say hi, maybe talk about some memories from the California days, and, and then I would go on my way for the rest of the weekend. Sometimes I would buy her items to support her as well. Here's a statement from my girlfriend Vanessa, meeting Jackie during our relationship. And so he provides a snapshot of uh, Vanessa's commentary. Throughout my time dating Gonzalo, the friendship between Jizu and him from what I have seen always had a friendly brother-sister vibe. Gonzalo introduced me to her and he would greet her at tournaments. I remember getting along with her. Our first interaction between us was at a tournament a few hours away from my house and Gonzalo ordered some shirts from her stand up for me. Sorry, from her stand for me, I apologize. Remember, I remember us really complimenting and loving her work. I'm confused to see these accusations from her, seeing as how friendly their relationship was from what I saw. 
and here's proof of the shirts being purchased and the date for that. Zero says to her, Jackie, me and Vanessa haven't gotten our shirts. It's almost been a month. I'm crying, sad emoji. She responds, Sub Zero, I'm currently on a trip right now, but the t-shirts have been set to ship out at the end of the month. We got so many orders that the manufacturing is taking longer than we'd like. My apologies for the wait, though. Let Vanessa know I'm sorry, too. The date of Zero's response for this is uh, July 29, 2015 at 1.23 p.m. He says, sound good. With uh, After that, he posts three exclamation marks. Addressing her claims. Now that I've showed you a timeline, the look of the place, videos and pictures of her interactions, let me address the direct claim she made toward me. Here's the statement I linked above reads. You were showing me explicit Craigslist, Craigslist ads of sex workers and hentai on the big screen and constantly harassing me at the Sky House when I was 15. The first thing to note is she's talking about the big screen in the middle of the room. This is the specific room she's talking about seen in this video. As you can see, there's a big TV on the side. As mentioned before, I did not have a computer at the time and instead use this little laptop. The big TV slash monitor as well as all PCs on that table and the table itself were all Jackie slash Jesse's belongings. While they did let me use their faster computer from time to time, I'd like to stream since my laptop sucks. Sucked. It felt it feels very weird that I would be looking at inappropriate things, considering not one person lived in that room, but five people did. Two in each bunk bed, me, Mewtwo, King, Jackie, Jesse, and one more person in the back of the room in a mattress. There is no sense of privacy, and that was a big theme at, at the Sky House. No one had privacy for anything, and you had to go outside to get some fresh air. If I would have done anything immediately creepy to her, it's extremely likely a roommate in that same room or in the house would have noticed, considering we lived in a small house with 10 plus people. He continues on, he quotes it again. You were showing me explicit Craigslist ads of sex workers and hentai. I don't understand the context of this, nor have any recollection of this. Craigslist is not a website I really use, and we never had any type of sexual interactions in our times interacting. It feels out of character for me to just show this to her randomly. Hentai is something I do look at. But again, it would not be looking at I would not be looking at it in a room full of roommates. Neither would make it sense to do it on their computer of all places. That wasn't me messing up. That's what Zero wrote. I don't understand if this is if this part is a joke I randomly pulled out to make fun of Mewtwo King or something, and she happened to see it accidentally. But looking back through our entire conversation logs, I never shared a single picture with her of this nature, nor is there a single log of her ever mentioning it. She mentions the harassment happened in the Sky House. I do not have any recollection of this. As I established above the timeline when she lived in the Sky House and when she moved out, this means she's claimed it happened in late 2014, early 2015. Looking back at her messages in my memory, I only remember interacting with her fondly with me and this extends well into 2016, which is well after we were roommates, which is the timeline she is talking about. Thank you for listening to my story, and I hope this clears things up a little bit. If there's anything else I need to address or she makes a follow-up statement, I will also address it. Once again, please do not harass her in any capacity. I understand a lot of people are very upset, and I do not want my followers to attack anyone. So this is Zero's first response to her. Um, of note, Zero doesn't deny the allegations. But he does play dumb. And so he says, well, I really don't remember doing these things. But in all fairness to Zero, he doesn't outright deny these things. So that is his first response. That's also the first accusation. Now, next up, there was a second allegation on uh, July 3rd, 2020. It's entirely possible, perhaps I'm getting the dates wrong for these. Sorry, I apologize. Not the dates wrong, but maybe the order of chronological events wrong for this. But I believe the next step of what happened in this was Katie making a twit longer. And so I'll be reading that. 
Dear at Zero Wondering, all I wanted was an apology. I want to preface this with, if you know my story and who I am, please do not reveal my identity. If the time comes, I will do it myself. Screenshots are at the end of this message. Dear Zero, my name is Katie. I used to be in the Smash community. I was 14 years old during our conversations on Skype from September 2014 to January 2015. We met online when you were streaming on Twitch and I messaged you over chat. You seemed to take an interest in me and gave me your Skype username. I, Starstruck, made a Skype just for this and began chatting with you. I'll note that I was decently educated when it came to internet safety, but it mainly regarded things like don't message a stranger and whatnot. But you weren't a stranger. You were Zero, a top player. You won the E3 Invitational and several tournaments before. Having any attention from someone like you was mind-blowing to me. This is what made me an easy target. I was a young girl and raptured with the idea of being friends with someone I looked up to and admired. You used me in this state to flirt, manipulate, and ask for sexual favors from me. I didn't realize what any of your words imply until about two years later when the Me Too movement really started taking shape and I learned I wasn't the only one who had suffered these sort of things. To remind you, this is what happened in our conversations. You called me Kitty, Kitten, Honey, all mine, while flirting the entire time. You manipulated me. For example, you called me a pervert and made me believe it when in reality, I was being goaded to say things by you. You told me I was your secret, and so I couldn't tell anyone about our conversations. In streams, I would ask you to prove that it was really you sometimes. Do Mario side time after taking this guy's next stock. Next stock. Apologies. And you would. But you would never acknowledge me directly by name anywhere except Skype. The worst offense I can remember is that you asked me to masturbate with ice and take pictures. I lied when I told you I masturbated, as you asked, and then I declined sending you pictures. The worst part of this is that I did not take screenshots of this particular situation since I was so embarrassed by it. You want to make this activity a habit, that every two weeks I would do what you say for a day. Here's why I never came out about this. I blame myself. I admit I was extremely enthusiastic about it in our conversations because I was just enamored with the fact that I was talking with the top player. I idolized you, and you used that to your advantage. But because I was so naive, I considered myself responsible for years, and thought my experience would be invalid because of my actions. I didn't take screenshots of the worst situations. The, screens the screenshots I have were actually when I was so starstruck that what I thought was happening to me was special, so I kept them for posterity. Only later did I realize that the messages you sent were not good for me at all. The situation is not as bad as it could have been. We never met in person, so there was no physical assault. But now I realize incidents like this still deserve attention. You quickly became a huge force in the Smash community. I stopped playing Smash 4 because you were dominating it. I couldn't avoid you. Related to that, the community trusts you. The level of backlash I would get from this accusation would be immense. Literally tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people, would be against me. I knew I would get burned more than you. Despite the wave of stories that have been told lately, I still believe I will st I believe I will still receive immense backlash. She wants attention. She just doesn't like him. But trust me, I wish this never happened. And I wouldn't wish this amount of mental stress on anyone as well. I am only coming out now with this ordeal because of the recent stories with top players both in the fighting game community and Smash community. I realized that I wasn't the only one or one of a few. I realized that although I did not have it nearly as bad as some others, my experience still happened and should be acknowledged. These months of my life have haunted me for years. Ever since we stopped talking, it has been in the back of my mind. 
Whenever I saw a video of you or saw you talking to other top players, I admired or saw a fan talk about how great of a person you were. I would feel sick to my stomach. And the feeling has been growing even stronger these past few days, telling me that I have to say something. I have to speak up to end this conflict. I want to clarify that I'm not writing this to cancel you. I acknowledge that you have grown a huge fan base and have been immensely successful in the world of Smash. Still, I want people to know what I have experienced with you. I want to believe you have changed as a person. So originally, I want to message you privately and clear this up between the two of us. After talking to my family last night, when I told them the full story, the first time I had revealed all of it to anyone, they convinced me that I should not talk to you privately because it would not be safe. To be honest, I don't feel any safe for revealing this to what might be the entire Smash community and beyond. But I have been suffering in silence while people call you the nicest Smash player or the guy who can do no wrong. I cannot let this go for the rest of my life as I continue to associate myself with the gaming community. This is the next step, sorry. This is the next step I have to take toward healing. All I want now is closure, a genuine apology. I was a kid back then. I was stupid. But you were an adult and you should have taken responsibility and said no. You never should have encouraged any of it. I am now an adult, as, o as old as you were when we first talked, and I cannot imagine ever talking to a minor the way you talk to me. You knew what we were doing was unacceptable, and you should have stopped it way earlier than we did. I realize that you have the power to reject everything I accuse you of, that I do not have the evidence for. I understand that this was five years ago and that you have very likely matured and changed since it happened. But I want you to realize the effect you have had on me. I've grown as a person too, but I've had this burden on my heart for years and I want to let it go. I will very likely never return to the Smash community, in part because of what happened between us. But I want to close the book on the situation for good. Signed, Katie. And then she links some of the screenshots. So that's the second accusation that was brought against Zero. So next up, I'm going to be reading Zero's second response. The second response is very long, but I am going to try to read all of it for you. Um... I know sometimes people, while listening to audio like this, maybe you clean your room, maybe you're playing a game. Um, I understand that this is a lot of text. It's very inconvenient for people to just to sit down and read all of it. Um, and because of that, there's been a lot of misinformation about the Zero situation. So I'll continue reading on. That way you will be fully informed about all the events that occurred. Um, I may put my opinion out at the very end of the video. I may also make a different video stating my feelings on the situation. Um, I've been a fan of Zero for a very long time. And so, I mean, there's no nice way of putting it. It is very disappointing to both see the allegations brought up and then also hear Zero confess, as you will see moving forward. It's very disappointing. Uh, there is no excusing what he did. If you thought this is a video to uh, justify what Zero did, this is not. Um, but I, I will give my opinion at some point. Anyway, moving forward, I'm going to read the second response Zero made to these allegations. And again, this is uh, this one is uh, the longest, for sure. Hey, after I made my statements toward Jesus' claims, she came up with a series of tweets as a response. A new account also shared some new allegations, and Leffen also made a statement. I didn't I want to intervene, intervene for a second. I mentioned this. Leffen did make a statement. I might also put that up in this video. But I really want to focus on uh, Jizu and Katie's claims uh, because those were the most egregious. So, again, I may put it up on the screen, but we're going to focus on uh, those two. Continuing on. These are the main things I'll be addressing, as well as sharing my personal story of why my character is the way it is today, 
at the end of this statement. In this statement, I intend to take ownership for my mistakes and apologize to those I have hurt, as well as clear certain things up and also tell my story so I can be transparent about my character fully. Specifically, I want to start by taking ownership and apologize to Jizu, Katie, and Leffen for my actions. While the intent... I'll read that again. My apologies. Uh, very long. While the intent was not malicious on my end, I understand that the impact of my actions... I understand that the impact my actions had on others caused pain that I did not intend. Again, apologies. I'm going to be reading uh, all of this straight away. It's more than likely not going to be edited just because it's just so much to read. Um, I want to get this video out as soon as possible. So apologies for some of the spelling errors and whatnot. Um, anyway, continuing onward. I also want to preface that I want you guys to not harass anyone I involve in this document. I can't say this enough, but please do not. That harassment is the reason that people do not speak about injustices and fostering that kind of reaction is something that I absolutely do not condone. Words cut deeper than you all understand and have severe mental health impacts on victims. Let me now address each claim head on. Jizu statements. Jizu tweeted, and I'll, I'll put the snapshot up. She tweeted on July 3rd at 549 in the morning. She said, I've been getting death threats on here and on my personal Facebook. First off, F all of you who think I would do this for clout. I literally took a year off to process this all when I could have turned a blind eye and advanced my career. I'll say this again, but this it is not okay to harass anyone. Emotions are extremely high right now, and I really want to make it understood that harassing, sending threats, or anything of the sort is not going to help anything. Please cease this behavior. He links another snapshot where Jesus says, Secondly, Zero, you basically played dumb and said nothing. Using your girlfriend, you started dating when she was 15 and you were 20 as an alibi, and holding my kindness to you over my head doesn't excuse the abhorrent things I remember even if you conveniently forgot. Quick note, but the part about my girlfriend is 100% false. She was born in 1997 and I'm 1995. This means our age difference is two years of age, not five. It is also important to state that we did not have sexual interactions until after she was 18, and we were more serious about the relationship. She, she can make a statement if this is necessary. I want to intervene because I'm sure some of you are wondering, you know, you said these accusations are true. Is it true that um, Vanessa, you know, was 15 and he was 20 when they started dating? Uh, I, I can confirm that is false. Um... Vanessa was harassed on social media, and so she uh, was forced to make a statement about it, you know, giving her birthday and everything else. Um, so I just want to debunk this right now. We'll get into it a little bit more later, but just so you, don't, if you're, you won't be wondering. Uh, this is false. Uh, Vanessa is only two year, years younger than Zero. That was blatantly false on uh, Jesus' part. Again, we'll get into that a little bit more later. Continuing on to Jizu. After really looking into Jesus' claims, and from what I read from Leffens and IBDWs, I started to understand and feel that in the end, Jesus feels very wronged and affected, and ultimately she wants an apology directly from me. It is very obvious to me by now that she is hurting, and that's the entire point behind her actions. I just want to say I am very sorry, Jackie. I'm sorry for being a stupid, irresponsible teenager. I'm sorry for not being a good ally in the vul vulnerable position you were in the house. I considered you a friend, and from what it seems, I unintentionally hurt you and impacted you negatively. I just want you to know that I never intended to hurt you. And in general, I always respected you and appreciated you. During the conversations, I showed it was clear that we did have a friendship and it saddens me to know I tarnished that by being unaware of my actions and lack of them. I am sorry. And I will also take it to heart and improve myself in this regard. If you didn't want to talk about this further, my invitation for us to discuss this directly is also open if you want that. I hope this gives some type of closure and allows you to move on without feeling trapped by it anymore. 
As a community leader, I should know better, do better, and I can understand the anger from how my original post came across. Once again, I'm sorry. Moving on to Leffen's statement. Now, Zero takes a uh, snapshot of Leffen's statement, and so right here, I'll read it. That, you know, I don't know if I'm going to. I should provide a snapshot earlier, but if I didn't, I'll provide another snapshot of uh, this as well. Um, so, moving on to Leffen's statement. Lastly, I'd like to tell you all of the time I first met Zero. I've told this story before in stream, but I think it's relevant, so I'll tell it again. It was Apex 2013. Zero and a few other Japanese Smashers came over to where we were housed with many other Smashers and played. I didn't talk to them at all, but at one point, someone brought out a laptop, and Zero and one or two Japanese Smashers sat down on my sleeping bag. One of them hugged my pillow, and they start showing each other very explicit pictures of their favorite anime waifus. I remember distinctly that one of them showed pictures of the girl from Orimo, a popular incest anime, and yeah, that was very common and accepted at the time, so I don't judge that particularly harshly now, and remember being disturbed, especially since they were doing that by my stuff. So that's the snapshot that uh, Leffen posted read out loud. So Zero continues on. I do remember this exchange that Leffen mentions. At the time of Apex 2013, I was 17, and honestly looking back at this, I cringe. The Japanese players in question were older than me, and we just nonchalantly shared a couple of anime girl pictures as a joke pretty much. As to the very explicit part, I do not know what he means, and I feel this definition is different based on who you ask. But I don't remember showing something terrible or extremely explicit. I remember looking back at this exchange, and it shows my social awkwardness back then. I did not consider my actions could have made someone else uncomfortable, since I only saw me and the other people in the equation, and not someone like Leffen who could have seen. My intention was never to show him anything though, and despite me being a minor at the time, and stupid, I still feel this deserves an apology. I'm sorry Leffen. Back then, Smash was everything I had, in my stupid little head. Being able to be cool with the Japanese players was like the coolest thing in the world to me. Someone who has never been able to fit in any capacity in society. This does not excuse it, but it's the thought process I had. I feel the rest of Leffen's statements are covered by my response above to Jizu directly. Katie's Statements now this is Zero responding to the second accusation of the uh, the victim, Katie, who was, I believe, uh, 14 at the time. This is his response to her. To begin with, with, for context, I have never met Katie in my life, and we have never sent each other graphic pictures of any capacity. I want to make that very clear. I was also completely unaware she was underage until she told me, and that obviously made me feel extreme regret, and I felt disgusted immediately. Yes, we did talk. Be mindful that I do not have the logs of this conversation at all, and so I cannot add additional screenshot context. I will address the story individually per screenshot, so please read all of it. I was 19 at the time for reference. So what Zero is saying is uh, at the time of these messages, Zero was, uh, he was 19 years old, and she was uh, 14 years old. You know, whereas now he is uh, 25 years old. Now, I am going to make myself read these. All right, let's, uh, let's do this. All right, Monday, September 22nd, 2014. Zero says, yo, adorable. And she responds, Yoshi Tank is me. The dude is my bud. Aw, oh, thanks. Seriously, I'm blushing so hard right now. Zero responds, Lameo, adorable cutie. Lol. She responds, oh, be quiet. He responds, but you loving it, can't lie to me. She responds, yeah, I am. To make it very clear, the photo she sent was a picture of herself and her friends from her Instagram. My comments are horrendous here, and I regret them so much. Alright. She says, 
But don't take it like, oh my god, zero is so hot. No, 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 no. Not that kind of love. Well, maybe a little. I mean, what? By I love you like, I want to be like you. I mean, I'll be your little cute, adorable kitty that's also your personal cheerleader when you need it. I'd probably do anything for you. Not bad for a 14-year-old girl, huh? Your kitty and cheerleader. If that's not enough, I don't know what is. Zero responds, oh wow, I'm surprised. I had no idea you felt so strongly about me. Hmm, I'm honored. You're adorable and very nice. We can definitely talk more and stuff. I'd like to know you some more. But yeah, this hit me hard. Prior to this, I did not know she was underage until she said so. As you can see, my initial response is of surprise, and my awkwardness came through my comments, because at this point in time, I wasn't sure how to process it. Alright, here's the next screenshot. She says, you're so overdoing this. Why? I love how you react so funny to things. Mad adorable. It's like when you rub a cat's belly and they just roll around. She responds, you will not rub my belly. Yeah, he responds. Why only do that? Point blank, the last comment here, is very inappropriate and disgusting. I regret it tremendously. It, it, and it just shows I have a lot to learn and strive to be better. It's shameful and gross. I'm sorry. On to the next snapshot. He says, I promise I'll be normal if every two weeks we can do something like that. We're in the day. I can go all in. She asks, swear on the river sticks? He responds, Jason, I promise you, as long as you promise me that those days you were all mine. And she responds, fine. From what I recollect, she enjoyed this specific book or movie series. And I think I just Googled it and Jason is one of the characters in the series. And I can't remember if it's lyrics or a specific quote. I, I pretty much just grabbed it to kind of fit in with something she liked from something she mentioned earlier. This comment in general is just very inappropriate and disgusting. Regardless if it was a quote, that, that doesn't matter. All right, here's the next screenshot. He asks her, uh, what grade you in? She says, ninth, so I'm a freshman. Zero responds, OMG, you are a baby hand. Haha, <laughs> adorable. She responds, I know, and all my classmates are about six feet tall on average. Zero responds, ha ha. Any boys you looking at? All right, and then on to the uh, the next snapshot. She says, oh, thanks. And Zero says, smash skills don't matter, kitty. You'll grow out of it eventually. She says, well, maybe I could teach them smash. Hoo <laughs> hoo. He says, find yourself a nice, caring boy. Lemeo, please, fiend. And she says, well, most of the boys I know are jerks. This is pretty much by the end of our interactions from what I remember. Since I decided that continuing to talk to her was disgusting upon learning her age, I didn't know what I could do to stop communication and not make her feel terrible about it, which was something I was concerned about. I felt uncomfortable, but the need to not be cutting. I felt uncomfortable, but felt the need to not be cutting or ghost. Looking back, this is a very clear lack of judgment for me. And just stopping right there and then, even if being too, too direct, was the only option. And I see that today very clearly. I stupidly suggested for her to find a boy or another friend. So she would just hopefully forget about me and I wouldn't have to just suddenly cut communications, which I did in the end. In the end, I did everything wrong. I'm sorry. And I'm going to read the final screen, uh, uh, snapshot. She says, I was going to say I like his pit playing. Zero says, my pit though. She says, don't be a perv, man. And Zero repeats it, uh, my pit though. And she says in all caps, and yes, I still like your pit, MMK. He responds, Kate, you a perv, though. It's okay, you growing up. It's gonna happen. You are still a baby. This is for me suggesting what I said above, and she commented, don't be a perv, to me when I suggested the boy thing. I was then reassuring, like, don't worry, those things are for later. But my intention at this time was to exit the conversation, and I was so awkward, I couldn't find a way to do it without being direct, 
which is again my mistake and lack of judgment. I am not excusing any of it. I'm sorry. I just want to say how horrible this is in general. It feels terrible that I did this, and I feel a tremendous level of regret. I did apologize to her back then before I fully stopped talking in general, but this isn't in any of the screenshots, and knowing how awkward I was back then, it probably wasn't a good day anyway, and a new, better one is much needed today. I'm extremely sorry, Katie. I genuinely did see you as a friend back then. I had no ulterior motives or terrible intentions, and looking back, I clearly didn't act that way. I never, oh sorry, I should have, nor in a respectable, oh that's a spelling error, he says, I should have nor in a respectable or appropriate manner. I regret it, and I wish I could undo this sin, and I'm so sorry for bringing this upon you. You did not deserve it, you did not do anything wrong, and I just want to say that it is all on me. I should have known better. I should have been better. I should have been a decent human being. I failed at every single one of those things. And I can't say enough how sorry I am for this. If there's anything I can do for you to make up for it, I'd be glad to. I don't expect your forgiveness or anyone's, and I think that it's perfectly fine. But I think an apology is important for you to be able to heal, which is what matters most. I'm really sorry. All right, uh, continuing onwards. The reason I've always been very robotic, unaware of my surroundings, strange, and also unable to understand social cues is because I've never really been able to have a meaningful relationship with anyone in my life. I then thought for some reason jumping to another country on a different language barrier would be a great way to start over again. Looking back, I really am an idiot. I want to say once again, I'm not sharing this to get empathy in any shape or form. I'm sharing this because I want to be transparent with you, with why I am the way I am. Just lay it all on the table. A consistent theme has been, why is Zero weird? Why is he socially inept? Why is he strange and out of place so often? Let me answer that directly. This is the part where Zero goes into his, uh, his backstory, how it was growing up for him, and... As he says before, you know, there is a trigger warning, and I'm going to remind you, this: there is a trigger warning for this story. I cannot say that enough. All right, and so I'm going to read his uh, quote before he goes into it one more time, and we're just going to jump right into it. There is a very big trigger warning for the following story, and I recommend caution when reading it. It will help you understand me as a person. But I also want to say that I'm not looking that I'm not asking for sympathy or support when mentioning it in any way. I'm doing this to be really transparent with who I am, why I am the way I am, and hopefully this sheds light on why ultimately I'm a flawed person. This story will be difficult to type because a lot of it are things I've never told anyone, not even my mother, and I'm terrified of opening up about this. This will be long, but bear with me. I ad directly address everything right afterwards. When I was a little kid, around the age of five, my dad was everything in my life. My inspiration, my strength, and I admired him so much. My dad had a company and he was successful. And as my mom tells me from back then, I was inseparable from him. He would often take me to work with him and show me the cool things he was working on. My parents had their issues, which culminated in my dad starting a family with another woman. I've mentioned this before in my content, that I hate my dad, and I hate that he did that. That's not new information. What I've never told is how my mom found out how it happened. One day when my dad took me to work, I noticed his secretary was very close to him. As a kid, I remember them being closer than with my mom. I always felt strangely off about it, but obviously I'm just a little kid, so I was in no position to, to do or say anything. I was in my dad's office playing with some of his work equipment, I want to say a helmet, and then the secretary came in the room with my dad, and they start having extremely graphic sex in, my, in the room. 
My dad knew I was there and she saw me there, but they did not care and kept going. I felt paralyzed and terrified, and I do not remember when I left the room. But I remember crying outside and my dad coming to pick me up and told me to not speak a single word of what I saw. He was angry. I had never seen him like this before. He was yelling at me and looking at me so intensely. Looking back, I realized he was threatening me to be quiet. When I came home, I remember running to my ma room and crying. My mom comes to check on me, and my dad just goes, ah, don't worry, he fell. And my mom was just very worried for me. After a while, my dad left the room, and me and my mom could talk alone. My mom checked me up and noticed I wasn't hurt in any way. So she asked me what was so wrong. I don't remember exactly how I said it, but I told her what I saw. She confronted my dad. My dad did not react well. An argument ensued and then it quickly turned violent. My dad punched my mom and then started hitting her as hard as he could while she was on the ground. I was standing there just watching my mom be killed. I tried to yell at my dad to stop and he hit me instead. I remember my mom crawling through the door. Her face was full of blood. My dad started making a phone call and went back and went to the back of the house. And I just remember running to my mom. As she picked herself up, she said, we need to leave. He is going to kill me if we stay here. And to this day, I still remember that specific phrase is one of the scariest things I've ever heard. We fortunately lived only a couple blocks away from a police station. So I helped my limping mom to the police station on foot, her body full of bruises. When we arrived, my mom told everything to the police officer. He listened at first, then asked a couple questions. Then just said, got it, so give me his phone number and we will call him over for a statement. My dad came and proceeded to deny everything. Because my mom had no substantial evidence other than her bruises and no adult witnesses, no footage or accounts, the case could not move forward at all. I remember one of the cops actually laughing at my mom when she tried to argue against it. We had to go back home that night to my dad and my mom was shaking the entire way back. When we returned, my dad said we had to leave the house immediately gave me the option to stay with him or my mom. And I chose my mom. This is probably the worst thing that has ever happened to me. And this is the very first time I've told anyone about it. But this only started the next chapter of my life, which was really the collapse of everything I knew at the time. But this is what started breaking my character and personality. My mom says there's a very specific day where I just changed as a kid and just became a shell of what I was before. My mom was not able to really provide for us now that it was just me and her. We ended up driving to another city to stay at my mom's parents. After my mom told the story, my grandpa blamed her and said, I always told you to never date that man. It's your fault. And proceeded to say that if we wanted to stay there, she would have to do chores around the house and pay some type of rent Otherwise, we have to leave. I remember my mom having this look of disappointment, but not at them, but at herself. I feel she really blamed herself for all of this and took it so hard. Because we could not afford my schooling, I had to drop out of school for a significant period of my life. For about four to five years, I didn't go to school or had any type of interactions with anyone because I became a shut-in. This is when I was diagnosed with extreme depression, ADHD, and also suicidal thoughts. I remember those days as me just laying on a mattress and looking at the ceiling of my room, wondering why I'm even alive. Some days I would blame myself. Some days I felt so angry. And some other days I just felt my mom would have less trouble if I just killed myself. My mom tried very hard to save my life back then. She sold every single little belonging she had to support me, to see doctors, to have things to enjoy life. 
But the most intense part was that she always preached to me to never hate my dad. She always tried her best to make sure I never hated him. But it did not matter. At first, I was so angry at him. Over time, I became furious at her. Why isn't she upset? Why isn't she planning revenge? Looking back, my mom was wise beyond her years, but this was too much for me to process before the age of 10. As my mom stabilized herself, I got the opportunity to pick up on my studies. I was behind years and years and I was struggling just learning basic things. I began to really hate myself. I was so angry that I had become stupid. So angry that things that should be easy were now so difficult. For you to be able to understand, I wasn't able to do basic math functions at the age of 11 and 12. I could not go back to school like this. So my mom got me to go through this program where if you pass one big test, you can catch up on grades. I remember crying before the test because I knew I was so far behind, I was not going to be able to do it. I remember looking at the paper with my answers blank, and the lady who was there came to see me. She felt so bad and shocked that I didn't know anything that she basically wrote down the answers for herself and told me, it's okay. I'll help you pass. This to me is the saddest memory of my life because all I could think of at the moment was that I'll never be anything or anyone in life. I just want a car to crash on me. I want the pain and suffering to end. At this point in time, the only console I had was a GameCube and the game happened to be Melee. I remember just playing with computers and wishing they were people I could play with. In a lot of ways, this was my break. I could just disconnect from my life and worry about this and nothing else. It felt liberating. At some point in time, I started going back to real school and also was playing a bit of Smash on the side. My time in middle school was very turbulent. A lot of these memories are very suppressed within me, and this is one of the darkest periods of my life. In middle school, I did not know how to socialize with people. I hadn't been interacting with anyone for years. I only ever spoke to my mom here and there and never left my house. People bullied me, they made fun of me, stole my books, broke my glasses, and in general, I was the laughing stock of the class. I remember coming to school and just feeling terrified of everyone. One of the kids in my class who really hated me had a brother who was a senior in the school. I remember them whispering something during one of the breaks. When I went to the bathroom, the guy came in the bathroom right after me, locked the door behind me, and proceeded to touch me. He pulled my pants, and I remember him saying, if I say anything, he will kill me. I remember just being there, looking at him in the eye, and my mind just went blank. I could not move. I could not talk. I just stayed there and took it. He eventually just left and made sure to tell me if I said anything, he will come back. I never told this to my mom never told this to anyone. I internalized this as it being my fault and me deserving it. I remember coming back home and telling my mom I do not ever want to go to that school again and just crying. My mom looked so worried, but she helped me transfer schools. It scares me to type this because my mom didn't know any of this, and this will be the first time she will learn of it. I only hope she can forgive me. Moving forward from this, life just always felt like a blur. I started adopting this attitude that everything that happened to me was funny, or I would only remember the good things. It's like I was living my own lie. I was so affected from what happened that I convinced myself that I was gay to cope with it. In a way, I must have enjoyed it. I must have asked for it. It was a good thing it happened. And through my high school, I portrayed myself in a way that my classmates often thought I was gay, 
and essentially lived this lie in my head to cope with it. I lived this lie for years. I always talk about the good things that happened or the funny ones in my stories, but I never mention the bad things or how I often got beat up by classmates because they thought I was gay. It was a very miserable time of my life, and in my head all I wanted to do was escape reality. I wanted to go somewhere else and be someone else. And this is why I was so happy to go to America and be zero. At the time, my sister was my life support. She lived abroad and was the main person who helped me with my English. Suddenly, however, she passed away at a random day while commuting to work from an aneurysm. One day, I'm talking to her and she's telling me how we're going to go to America together and how everything is going to work out. The next day she's dead, and I had to watch it through video call from her husband at the hospital. I remember that day being very strange. I could not cry. For a while I told people that my sister is alive. Sometimes I would say I never even had a sister. You can actually catch me saying some of these things on very old videos or streams. But I never really came to terms with her death until very recently. I sometimes just pretended it never happened to begin with. It was easier than facing the fact that she died. This is pretty much a summary of my life up to the point where you guys are familiar with my story, which you can then see from my days in brawl tournaments and generally attending America. So that's the end of Zero's backstory and this is uh, the rest of his second apology. Moving forward, I want to take this time to ref self reflect and improve myself as a person. I always want to inspire people and be a beacon of reason. I failed. I've made some terrible mistakes that I deeply regret. I want to learn to be a better person one day, and I'm so sorry to everyone involved. With that said, my trauma in general, my terrible mistakes, a friend of mine committing suicide and friends who are not who I thought they were has had me in a horrible mental state, and I'm at a point where I feel I'm going to break. I don't know where to go from here. Please let me know if there's anything else I can do to make anything better. Zero. So that is Zero's second response. Now this is Zero's final response and as of this video I haven't heard of anything else from Zero on social media so this is it as far as Zero goes. He posted this on uh, the 4th of July. He says, I have to come clean. Hey, I can't sleep, and I just can't take this back and forth. I don't think it makes sense to keep this going. I just want this all to stop and for me to at least atone. I also want people to stop defending me. I, I don't deserve it. Katie, the screenshot you guys were wondering about the Ice Cube thing? It's true. The claims that Katie makes are true in general. There are no graphic pictures of anything of the sort, but it's unforgivable regardless. I want to just be clear about it here. There is one more girl I spoke to in 20... In, oh, my mistake. I'm just going to reread that. That was a mess. There is one more girl I spoke to in 2014 period, a bit earlier. Her name is Laura. Originally, she never told me she was underage. She said she was older than me. I have a screenshot of this, but doesn't matter nor make it better but years later she contacted me and said she was actually underage i apologized to her privately recently and i told her i feel absolutely terrible about it there's no graphic pictures or anything either that were exchanged and she's from another country i really want to atone and i just want this discussion to stop i'm not a good person and it doesn't matter how terrible my life was i did terrible things and that's the end of it I don't deserve for people to defend me. I'm working right now to obviously lose my sponsorships or any type of thing like that. I'm obviously not making more videos in general as well. I love you guys. Please don't be like me and please don't forgive me either. I won't forgive myself either. So if you were wondering, those are the two accusations that were brought forth against Zero. And those are also the three statements that Zero made in response to them. Um, it doesn't end there, though, because uh, Jizu, the original girl who brought forth the accusation, 
she claimed she released a, a very uh, long, I forget if it was a documentary or Excel spreadsheet or something, but she released a very long document documenting uh, some things against Zero, some things against Sky, if I remember correctly. It also documented a lot of he said, she said about him and Vanessa, uh, Zero's girlfriend, fighting and whatnot, um, her being underage. However, on July 5th, Vanessa gave Omni, Inferno Omni, he has a YouTube channel, you should check out his content, I recommend it. Vanessa gives Omni a statement from her to the general public. This is because Vanessa shut down her Twitter. I'm guessing it's because of the harassment that she probably was facing. You might think to yourself, um, oh, there's no way she's being harassed. And to that, I point out that Mewtwo King has been harassed for a crime that he's not physically capable of doing. Um, so unfortunately, there is a, a, a mob mentality. There are people just blindly attacking uh, figures in the Smash community. And so I'm sure Vanessa was harassed. I have no doubt in my mind. And after I read the statement, as you can tell by some of the wording, by some of the things she says, I'm sure you'll notice that too. There are implications of that. So anyways, on to reading Vanessa's statement. Note, Vanessa reached out to me, Inferno Omni, and asked for me to pass along this statement as she has long since deactivated her Twitter. I was born on November 27th, 1997. I'm nearly 23. I can't believe I'm being asked for my birth certificate to prove my age. And the abuse allegations are completely false. It's sickening. We did argue because I used to be unstable as shit and would always throw a fit by breaking stuff. Anyone that was has followed me back then on Twitter would know of my instability. But then again, this is no one's business. We have been dating for so long, this is my personal business with him. I don't appreciate people trying to use me as a means to hurt Gonzalo further. Please leave me alone. It is stupid to have to make a statement on this after I decided I don't want to be on social media anymore. What gives someone else the right to speak for me? People are only bringing this up out of spite at him. Not because they care about me in any way. Otherwise, they would reach out to me privately to check on me like real friends have. But that's not the case. Stop. I don't want to further the discussion and have to prove myself. I just want it. She says an end, but I'm assuming to end. And so that is, uh, that is all of the written drama that has gone on that those are the accusations that were brought forth to zero those were zero's responses zero mentions his backstory um again jizu made claims that vanessa was underage and that there was a domestic violence against vanessa uh vanessa herself debunks it and so now you are in the loop and now you have all the information at your disposal so you can make an edu educated decision for yourself though i will say you know in my opinion what zero did uh, was wrong. It was wrong. There's there's, uh, there's no justifying it. Um, I'm not going to say it's unforgivable. I think unforgivable is a very strong word. Really strong word. Unforgivable should be used for the, the worst of people. Serial killers, serial rapists, some really, really heinous people. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say unforgivable, but what he did was clearly wrong. 